We're going to go ahead and get started. Is everybody hearing me okay? My name is Vicki Eggers. I'm from Cooley Law School in Michigan. And I'm talking today about how to develop a web course on a shoestring. Let me give you a little bit of background information on Cooley. Um, as you can see, we've got three campuses. Um, we're a private law school. We have about 3,400 students. We have 118 full-time faculty and 148 adjuncts. So we're a very large campus. We have about 20 people, give or take, in our IT department. Um, about four and a half years ago, I was recruited to come in and help Cooley develop distance education. And that meant video conferencing and web course. 
And like most institutions that venture down the distance education path, they little realize the resources needed or staffing needed, software needed, or how it impacts and changes every department within the institution because now you're doing things so much differently than what you were doing them before. I was really excited when I came on board um, to Cooley because they had approved the software media site. How many of you are familiar with media site? It's a really nice, Lori, yeah, Lori's working on web course development too, so chime in at any time. But media site's wonderful because you put um, you can put your video in one window and you can do your PowerPoint in another window and there's an interactive part of it and we were really excited about that. Um, that was approved five years ago and we don't have it yet. So that's how long it takes to work through the process and our IT department, bless them, they have a large institution to, to manage, but their priorities aren't my priorities. And I had a job to do. I was given the task of getting web courses developed. And I, after two years, I figured, okay, how are we going to do this on a shoestring? So what we did is we looked at um, what we already had available within the institution. And I'm going to share that with you today. Um, feel free at any point to ask questions. Um, I might cut you off and say we'll talk about that at the end of the session if we get too long because I do want to get through the presentation. Um, the technology is only as good as the conversations that surround it. And let me tell you, we've had a lot of conversations. Uh, sometimes they got a little heated uh, about what was distance education, what was web, web course development. and. Our first priority is teaching and learning, and then we fit that into what we have for resources to support it. So we don't let the technology drive the teaching and learning. We, we want the teaching and learning to drive the technology. So we're not doing anything fancy. I think what I'm showing you today is more the process and development stages to get there than it is the fancy technology, because we use really basic stuff. Here are my goals um, for the session today. And all of you look like you're completely drained, and some of you, your eyes are already glazed over. So stop me at any point. I'm going to try to get this, through this relatively quickly. But what I want to do is share one of um, Cooley Law School's courses with you. Um, we're very proud of the professor whose course we chose, and when we asked him if we could share it with the rest of you. He agreed wholeheartedly, so we're excited about that. And then, as I said before, the resources used, um, our development model. At this point, it's an informal development model, and I'll talk about that more later. It has not gotten any formalized approve, approval from our curriculum committee or our organization, and that's intentional. Um, we didn't want to shut down the, the process before we fully realized what it is that we wanted. It's one of those you don't know what you don't know until you get there and you figure it out kind of things. So we based the development of our web course within our graduate program intentionally because the graduate program isn't under the auspices of the ABA which has restrictions currently on what you can do with distance education. So we didn't have to worry about compliance. Although, what we did want to do is make sure that whatever we developed in the way of um, processes, uh, products, could eventually, and we're to that point now in our organization, be rolled over to the JD side and we would have all the uh, components in place to be in compliance with the ABA. ABA rules. This is what we use. We use Word. We use Westlaw Twin. How many of you were at the Westlaw session earlier today? Or how many of you already use it? Okay. And we use Callie's Classcaster. So we use Word to develop um, our weekly schedules. We use Westlaw's course management system. And then we use Classcaster to record what we call summary lectures or mini lectures. 
we did not want to, first choice by faculty was let's just record what's happening in the classroom and then we'll put it up on the web and then that'll work. Well, for three hours of lecture, to listen to it on a computer is not a best practice for distance education. So what we asked them to do is identify three key points in their three hour lecture and try to hone it down to a critical need to know 20 minute summary lecture. So it was more palatable to our students to sit there for 20 minutes than for three hours. And a lot of what was happening in the traditional classroom were Q and A's or, or sidebar kind of things. So once faculty got used to that, it wasn't a bad thing. So let me show you a little bit about what the course looks like, and then I'm going to backtrack and show you how we got there. This is what the course looks like in Westlaw. Um, we have down the left hand side here, we've incorporated um, some rules for some success, some FAQs, a syllabus that looks a little bit different than your traditional syllabus. Um, it was tailored for the web. In your traditional syllabus, you might have all the weekly information posted there. We do not do that because we've got a weekly schedule with the same information, so we didn't want to duplicate it. Um, we had to put in information about how students got textbooks. We have students in the Bahamas, we had students in Spain, we had students in Texas, so they were not near a campus to get their, their textbook, so uh, we had to put in a process for that. We had some copyright issues on some of the media that we used, so we had to point that out. Um, we wanted to get across to students that online does not mean easier. In fact, oftentimes it's more difficult online because you have to be a self-motivated and self-regulated learner. So it was important that they knew that ahead of time. And we have rejected students uh, from taking online courses because they could not demonstrate that they could operate in this environment and be successful. Um, a little bit of netiquette stuff. We don't want to harp, but there are some things I think you have to bring up uh, just as a reminder to students and uh, what the grading expectations were. That's pretty, pretty similar. So um, then what we do is we do a weekly schedule. And if I open up week one for you, this is a template process. Um, pretty much every course looks the same way. We change the color heading. We change the graphic. Um, we always ask the faculty to do an introduction. Some of this is for the faculty's um, purpose as well it is for the students because we want to, them to think about what it is they really want the students to walk away knowing and then to identify two to three goals for the week. Um, we always have a, time, a deadline for submissions. Uh, here, uh, Professor Corbett, let me talk about him a little bit. He's taught this class, it's a cyber crimes class, which is really kind of cool. He taught it face to face for several terms, and then we asked him to do the web based. And in the development process, he said, This is what I do in my face to face classroom. I do a couple weeks of foundation building, then I bring in 10 to 12 guest speakers, and they talk about topics spe specific to cyber crimes. These are people who actually work in the cyber crime arena and we're lending different perspectives on this topic. So it wasn't just him teaching. So we had all these people that he typically brings into the classroom. Now we had to incorporate them into the online environment. Um, let me play uh, just a faculty summary lecture for you. I won't play the whole thing. We played around a little bit with music at the beginning um, for the first couple weeks just so the students could get a sense with their um, computers what the sound level was going to be. Greetings. My name is Patrick Corbett. Uh, I will be a professor for this term's class on cyber crimes. Uh, the presentation I have for you today is Introduction to Computer Crimes and Other High Tech Offenses. Before I begin, I kind of want to give you a little bit of a background about me so you know who it is that's going to be speaking to you this term. Uh, 
and they'll touch her as well throughout the term. One thing Professor Corbett was really good at doing is building that connection with the students. So a lot of times he would start out his summary lectures to, just by telling a little bit a story that he had in his experience or a case that he read about or a newspaper article that he had just seen. So he kind of built, worked very hard to build that rapport with the students. Um, if I would click on the theft of the trade secrets, this was by a presenter, Terence Berg. You would have the same kind of audio. Um, but what was really unique um, with this is that um, Mr. Berg then moderated the bulletin board for that week's session. So after the students listened to the 20-minute presentation that he did, there was a bulletin board for the students to go and post questions, and then Mr. Berg interacted with the students for that week. That was repeated almost every week. Um, so that it was not just Professor Corbett that they were listening to, they also had access to other experts in the field. So we had the multimedia to lend a little bit of interest and to give the faculty an opportunity to um, connect with the students. We had the reading component. Um, this is nice with TWIN, um, especially in the research and explore section is if you cite the classes within TWIN, and let me see if I can find some. These are all Westlaw citations. But when you create the document with, in Word, if you cite uh, the case and then load it up to Westlaw, it automatically links to the, um, the, the court document or the case review, whatever it is you're trying to connect to. So we had the research explore, and then down at the bottom we had inner um, action, because we, that, if you know anything about distance education, that always comes up in the conversations is how do you um, engage with these students who are at a distance. So um, we felt like this uh, was a good fit for our institution, and the document that you're looking at here, this is probably version five or six of what we went through. So. It works for us. You, you might want to do the same kinds of things. I'm sure you will. What you start out with um, will go through several evolutions before you get to a point where you're comfortable. And the other thing is the faculty always has a say in how this looks as well. So you might tailor something specifically for them. Um, Classcaster. Let me back up just a little bit and talk about, about Westlaw and um, we like it because it, ought, it was easily accessible to us. It's free to law schools. If you use Westlaw, you have access to um, TWIN. So it isn't going to cost you any more money to outlay. TWIN is wonderful because it has the um, legal linking to the cases, and they've just updated it, and it will have terminology, legal terminology linking. So if you use a, a legal term within your document, it will link to the definition that goes with it. The downside of using TWIN is when they do upgrades or revisions, they're not always upgrades or revisions that are beneficial to you. Um, if I go back and show you, we used to be able to, on our TWIN course, have one of these documents, when you clicked on the weekly schedule over here, week one would show up here. So we were altering. We had all the documents loaded, but the current week is the one that would load. So as soon as you clicked on weekly schedule, week one showed. And we thought that was really a great tool. Um, and then the students knew everything that they had for the week. The current revision now does not allow you to do that, to choose one document to fully display upon the click. So they're adding more clicks to the process, which for some might be beneficial, for us it was not. It's not like if you use Blackboard or if you use WebCT or whatever that you have a version and that version stays because you've purchased
you can feasibly deliver. And then adopt a continuous improvement approach. So every time you get done with that initiative, look at it and say, what could we have done differently to improve it? Either the process or for faculty or for us or for the students or for the institution. And it's going to take you a while to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. Okay? How's that for web course in a nutshell? To change the title. I know you're on information overload, but does anybody have any questions at this point in the day? You're all like melting, melting. You know where I am, which is yeah. But what you just showed me just kind of reminded me of the Google Doc that I And my PowerPoint slideshow is on the, the wiki on the website, so. You know, if you're in a more refreshed state of mind and you want to look at this stuff, or email me at any time, I would be glad to, you know, give you my two cents worth. It varies. It's generally only three or four. The faculty person, me, I might have a person that can provide some technical assistance. Generally, it's me, me, me. Yeah. Uh, one or two. Uh, one thing that we haven't been able to do, because our graduate program, I mean, we say we have 34 students, but we probably only have 100 in our graduate program. So I don't feel like we fully tested our theories for this, because I think you need to have a significant population. Most of our graduate courses have had five or six or seven students. I would like to see something with 20 or 30 students and see if it works as well for that size population as a smaller does. So thank you all very much. I'm glad to stick around if anybody else has questions, but you all look like you need to get out of here and do something better. Just to leave this the way it is? Oh, um, sure. We don't have any of your equipment? Yeah, I've got to get my phone. Oh.